yourselves at Stingray City, is it? Yes. Yes. Did they tell you how Stingray City started? Yes. So this is where you were, in the middle of our replenishment <laughs> zone right here. And you were standing in knee deep, knee and um, waist deep water, is it? Yes. On the sandbar. So a little under a hundred years ago, we had fishermen who would fish and they would bring their catch right on a sand mound and they would clean the fish before they brought it in. They would throw the entrails overboard and give it to the other fish um, that were around marine life, including the stingrays. And the stingrays became very happy and they pass the message to each generation these guys are good for food leave your barbs to other islands so that's how it started um, the reason why we used to clean the fish right there is because we were we had the highest the highest population of mosquitoes <coughs> per square mile in the world and if the fishermen dared bring their catch in to clean, they would be devastated by mosquitoes who would eat them and the catch. So that's the story behind our Stingray City. Thereafter, they'd start bringing their families to come look at the phenomenon. And then they started bringing tourists about 75 to 80 years ago. And that is when that's how Stingray City started. Today, each Stingray is valuable to our economy to the tune of nearly $400,000 per Stingray. So we really treasure them. I think you're from you're from England, is it? Yeah. Well, we are your cousins, a British overseas territory. And our history our history started with permanent population during the last
Lato 1600s and 1700s when Francis Drake started coming here on behalf of Queen Elizabeth I he would stop here and attack Spanish galleons and raid them and come back here to get water and food and he found our turtles very exciting to eat and our crocodiles we had crocodiles that were small and tasty and um, that's where we finally derive our name the Cayman Islands from the Cayman crocodile and then you were in the mid 1600s during Sir Francis Drake's time it was about 1586 where he first recorded stopping here and then in 1655 the Spanish were attacked by the British because the Spanish were the ones who came in this area first. Columbus came here by mistake in 1492. He was trying to find a short route to China and India and he got lost and he ended up in what became Jamaica. What became Jamaica and what became Hispaniola and Cuba. So uh, he made two other voyages and on his fifth, on his third voyage, he came across our two sister islands. So we are Grand Cayman, which is this. And above us, we've got Cayman Brac and Little Cayman. Cayman Brac is about 140 miles north of us. And Little Cayman is five miles beyond that. Just above that is Cuba. Below us to the east is Jamaica. So that's where we are. And we're 86,000 in population between the three islands. Most of us live on Grand Cayman. And you're going back to Georgetown, our capital now. And 2,500 of us live in Cayman Brac. In Little Cayman, we have 150 people. 150. Oh. So if you don't get along with your mother-in-law, it's not a good place to live. And I can speak from experience. So, uh, after Francis Drake came around, he was a privateer who was given a letter of mark, authority by his queen to attack Spanish galleons uh, because this area was fundamentally Spanish colonial territory and the British, the Dutch and the French got envious and jealous and so they fought the Spanish for some of their territory. In 1655, Jamaica was taken away by the British under Admiral Penn and General Venables who came from St. Kitts and Barbados. The two first British colonies in the area, they attacked Jamaica, took it away from the Spanish and within 40 years they turned Jamaica into the rum capital of the world and the slave hub of the Western Hemisphere. Jamaica and Cayman being very close in proximity, Cayman was, a, was placed under Jamaica, the governor. We shared a governor. And the prosperity of Jamaica caused the Spanish to try to take it back on numerous occasions. Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of England, during a time when England had no king, king or queen, he then deployed a large contingent of navy and army to protect Jamaica, Cayman, Barbados, St. Kitts, and the islands. And he successfully did that. Some of Oliver Cromwell's navy ran away and came here to start plantation life. Jamaica was such a vivacious economy. It was a $6.5 billion annual economy 
between 1720 and 1825, just before the abolition of slavery in 1834. Rum was invented in Barbados in 1704, but made worldwide famous by Jamaica, because Jamaica is about near 30 times the size of Barbados, and so could grow a lot more sugarcane, and produce a lot more that would then go over to England. So, Jamaica became very valuable to England, and that's why Oliver Cromwell sent that large flotilla. So Welshmen, Scotsmen, Irishmen and Englishmen who ran away from Oliver Cromwell's navy because they were conscripts. They were pressed into the army and navy, came over here to, to replicate the Jamaican economy. And they did to an extent, even though it was different. It was a lot lower level, a lot more vulnerable to hurricanes. And there was a lot more salt in the earth. So the crop yield was not as good. So we became a British territory officially after the Treaty of Madrid in 1670, when Spain woke up and decided to stop the fighting, give her enemies some of what they wanted and make money. So after 1670, Treaty of Madrid, we, along with Jamaica, Barbados, and kids, the Turks and Caicos Islands became British territory officially. I'll come back to that shortly. This is the best Burger King location in the world. <laughs> and this is Mr. Arthur's little clapboard shop across from his old printry and his old cottage. Been there from 1897 and survived over 87 hurricanes um, since 1886 when we started recording hurricanes. 